seniors. Um, today, I want to, um, uh, well, talk about the apogee of autocracy, the, the dates at the end of the 18th through the middle of the 19th century. The term itself actually is taken from the title of a biography of one of the emperors that we're going to encounter today, Nicholas I, um, who reigned uh, from 1825 to 1855. And a historian writing at the end of the old regime and at the very beginning in the early 1920s of the new Soviet order by the name of Alexander Presnyakov um, wrote um, what actually was a genre that wasn't all that fully developed at the beginning of the, cent of the 20th century, wrote a biography of, of Nicholas, a very thin one, so graduate students love reading it because, you know, you get a lot in a small book, called The Apogee of Autocracy. And, you know, the title always says a thousand words, and so here really was the notion that in this reign, and I'm basically expanding the chronological boundary somewhat, um, in this period of time, um, the Russian autocracy and the Russian empire that that autocracy ruled reached the apogee of its grandeur, its power, and its prestige. And that certainly if we were to think about this period of time, and think about this period of time for a second, so, you know, this is um, Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein. This is um, uh, Ludwig uh, von Beethoven um, composing all of the symphonies, including the ninth. This is, and he's a major player in today's lecture, this is Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, this is the beginnings of, in England in the 1820s and the 1830s, and we'll see a bit of this in Russia as well today, the beginnings of a technology that would transform the 19th century, the internet of that age, the railroad soon followed by the telegraph. Um, this is a, um, a period of time in which a very young woman, in love with her continental European husband, and at the beginning of a reign, Queen Victoria, that would populate the royal houses of Europe, including the Romanov royal house, that Victoria came to the throne. And this was actually a period when in 1850, in basically what is now in Hyde Park in central London, um, the uh, British constructed the Crystal Palace Exhibition. Literally a huge pavilion hall made out of iron and glass to display the accoutrements and the accomplishments of what by 1850, thank you, um, of what by 1850 um, was uh, known as the Industrial Age. So this is a period of some importance in, uh, in European history and in world history for that matter. And it's also one that when historians of Russia turn to these years, they tend to title the apogee of autocracy. And it's that subject that I'd like to explore today. Well, when you begin, you have to, in the first instance, you know, we have to kind of step out of this and bounce into Western Civ, essentially. Um, for a moment or two and contemplate what, especially for Americans, is at times a somewhat difficult notion to put their heads around. The key revolution of the 18th century didn't happen in the United States. It didn't happen in America. Uh, those events in the 1770s and 1780s were an absolutely critical prelude, and particularly uh, from my point of view, intellectually an absolutely necessary prerequisite to the events of the French Revolution that began in France in 1789 and that really began a revolutionary era that um, stretches from the 1790s until, for the sake of this argument today, until the defeat of Napoleon in 1814 and in 1815. You, you do have to pause for a moment and I want to pause for a moment on this slide and just ask you to think a bit about the way in which our own modern political vocabulary is framed by these events as a way of thinking about the impact of the era and how critical a turning point in world history it actually was. Um, if you look at the list as I march through the notes, um, here is an era that privileges key, key verb, 
that privileges for the first time the rights of man and the rights of a citizen. Hence the pamphlet, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, drafted and passed by the French National Assembly in August of 1789. And privileges those universal human rights over and against absolutism, monarchical rule, and also, and most importantly, perhaps, hierarchical social order itself. Right? Where the equality of the individual, the man, the human being, in our 20th and 21st century parlance, and the citizen is absolutely assumed. Yeah, we can find that in American documents, no question about it. I'm not trying to downplay the one and upgrade the other. Right? But in terms of our modern political sensibilities and understandings, it, those are rooted in these decades. Its greatest slogan, right, here found on a stamp, liberty, equality, and fraternity, are goals, ultimately, of modern political life. The goals of individual liberty, of civil equality, and of social justice, goals, by the way, that we still debate today, wildly so. And those debates are rooted in this era as well because the three modern ideologies that basically debate about how to achieve liberty, equality, and social justice, i.e. conservatism, liberalism in a 19th century European sense, and socialism are all rooted as idea systems are all rooted in the events of this era as well. And for that matter, rooted in um, this era as well are, if you look at, um, well, <laughs> long live the nation, a Louis XVI reduced to a constitutional monarch wearing the red cap of liberty um, in a, plainly in a, a, a woodcut uh, political cartoon of the era drinking a toast, and if you were to read this, vive la nation, long live the nation, right? Um, he didn't drink it loud enough, plainly, because in January of 1793, um, uh, the French Revolution includes, not for the first time in world history, this had happened in England in the 17th century, includes regicide as well. But two basic ideas, which, let's face it, are very much part of our political vocabulary today our birth in this era. Terror as a political instrument, state violence as a political strategy on the one hand, and the very notion of revolution on the other. That is revolution, which people will remind us oftentimes, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, for example, revolution which conveys in all languages this notion. And some would say the problem with revolution is that it begins and it goes through a chaotic upheaval and it ends up right back at the same place. Although Solzhenitsyn would say, well, yeah, but the wheel turns, and when a wheel turns, it moves. Um, uh, but the notion here is that revolution, not simply as a, um, well, as a declaration of independence, that I make my kids listen to me reading on the 4th of July when it's actually in the newspaper, although they hate it, and they say, that's dad being dad. Um, and a lot of our students, and maybe a lot of us actually, would be hard pressed to get anything except the favorite excerpts that we like most out of that document from it. A really inspiring set of ideas on the one hand, one way of thinking about revolution, but a French revolutionary era that in fact takes on not only the political order, but the social, economic, and indeed even the cultural order as well. Revolution is a wholesale upheaval. Um, the short version of that um, inspiring beginning is that the French Revolution is, in the era that it contains, is really, really important and has a massive impact on the era, so much so that its echoes still reverberate among us today, even when you take those echoes on in this kind of generalized way that I just featured um, to you. So I begin there because then there's a really interesting question. Well, how does that, all of that, how does all of that impact these people? The Romanov royal family, the Russian autocracy, 
and the Russian Empire, whose roots we looked at last week. Now, I want to talk about this and the impact upon um, the empire in very personalized terms and look for a moment at this extended family. This is an interesting way to think about it because the period that we're looking at, 1796, extends from the death of the matriarch, Catherine the Great, who had the distinction of overthrowing her husband, Peter III, to begin her reign in 1762. And I'm not going to comment on anything other than my, my own marriage. And I hope my wife doesn't actually contemplate this, actually wasn't directly involved in his death, but certainly sponsored and led the coup that overthrew him and that led to his death. The matriarch who dies then at the end of her reign in 1796, who yields to her son, Paul, the estranged and alienated son of the father, Peter III, who reigns for a very brief period of time to be succeeded again um, by a palace coup and an overthrow, the last to actually take place in the history of the old regime, by his son, her grandson, Alexander I, an important player in today's commentary because he and Napoleon have some things to do with each other in um, the next two decades, and who, when he dies in 1825, is succeeded by his not next oldest, but next, next oldest brother, um, uh, Nicholas, who reigns until 1855 and who, for reasons that we want to get to today, um, earned the sobriquet, um, the apogee of autocracy and the gendarme of Europe. Well, to run through this, so what was the impact of all of this on, on this extended family? I mean, let's start with Catherine. Catherine, after all, um, fancied herself to be an enlightened absolutist monarch. And in many ways, she was. You'll recall last time talking about the Enlightenment and the way in which the Enlightenment was a product, uh, that, the way in which the Enlightenment produced a kind of enlightened absolutism an ethos of enlightened a absolutism, a belief in the regularity and the rationality of law and the way in which law, if governed by human reason and reflecting human reason, could create order, well-being, and common weal in the realm. Catherine completely believed this. She corresponded with all of the great philosophes of the, of the age, with Voltaire, with D'Alembert, with Diderot, um, all of them like marquee names in the French Enlightenment, bought Voltaire's library when Voltaire died. Uh, she w embraced the ideas of political liberty, of political change and political reform. The very same ideas, after all, that were inspiring a man like Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence. The French Revolution, when it originally arrived in 1789, when it arrived especially among the elites of, of the empire in cities like Moscow and in St. Petersburg, was greeted enthusiastically. And it was greeted enthusiastically by an elite that fancies itself, that fancies itself to be French. It speaks French. It wears French fashion. It reads French literature. As I said last time, oftentimes it has difficulty understanding the Russian of its peasant servants. And so the notion that actually modernity had now broken out in France, that the ancien regime, the old regime was passing away and a new era of liberty and rational moderate freedom was beginning on the continent itself in the most civilized of countries, played quite influentially within Russian elite circles. If that was civilization, well, of course, we should have that sort of civilization as well. Catherine, of course, found this to be a somewhat more dubious set of propositions, ever more dubious as the revolution itself radicalized, and especially dubious once it moved into the realm of regicide. Now, one never knows if this old woman
actually at some point or another, in fact, began to go like this when the words of the execution by guillotine of Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI made its way to St. Petersburg. But you can only, in fact, imagine from the policies that followed, very deliberate, arbitrary, yet harsh and firm censorship of books and printed material being imported into um, the empire, a policing, a censoring, a banning of enlightenment ideas, an arresting of scattered public proponents of not just now enlightenment thinking, but especially of left-leaning Jacobin thinking as well. The reaction that comes from Catherine by the time she dies in 1796 is quite negative indeed. Enter her son. Um, her son, who is estranged from her mother, in fact had lived apart entirely from her mother, uh, for those of you who have been to um, the environs of St. Petersburg, you may have visited the suburban palace of Pavlovsk, um, a late 18th century enlightenment setting, beautiful parks and beautiful palaces. That was Paul's palace where he lived with his German wife, Marie Fyodorovna. Um, Paul's sympathies, unlike his mother, whose sympathies were French, were Prussian and German. Unlike his mother's sympathies, which were intellectual in character, his were militaristic. He preferred drilling troops to reading Enlightenment literature. His reaction to um, the outbreak of revolution in France, which by the middle part of the 1790s actually extends to aggressive, offensive military operations on the part of French Republican armies, is to join the first European coalition against the, the new French Republic and to fight it in a losing cause. His arbitrariness, however, um, his proizvol is the word in Russian, a word that actually conveys not all, only arbitrariness but a kind of craziness. Ultimately, his turn away from Francophone culture and French customs and sympathy toward France if now only in terms of its style and its culture and its clothing and its language, um, uh, alienates much of the, uh, of the elite, particularly among officers in the guards regiments, especially um, in his own son, who has been raised not by Paul, but in this crazy extended family history that I'm laying out before you. And like all family histories, it is confused and it is complex and it is full of personal recrimination, even hatred. Uh, Alexander isn't raised at all. At Pavlovsk, Alexander is raised um, by his grandmother in the very same traditions of the Enlightenment that she indulged throughout most of her reign. And Alexander, in 1801, participates in a plot to overthrow his father. And when he comes to the throne, a very young man, after all, somebody can do the math for me, but you know, he's 24 years old. And when reigns change, and particularly when reigns, the reign changes in this country, it's a time of renewal. It's a time of optimism. It's a time of hope for change, particularly following the arbitrary rule, however briefly, of the father, Paul I. Alexander is known to have Jacobin sympathies. He's known to have left-leaning sentiments. It's rumored that he's surrounded by a so-called secret committee, that's how it's portrayed in the literature at least, but a small circle of advisors, equally young, equally French, one of them Polish. That's a double-barreled problem for Russian conservatives, actually, French and Polish. Nothing could be worse than that. <laughs> Who themselves are advising the new young emperor to actually, in fact, begin to undertake mildly reforms. Embrace in the first instance, and it becomes a real hallmark of the first decade of Alexander's reign. Embrace in the first instance the notion that rational law and administration breeds individual and general well-being. So that Alexander actually, in fact, creates in the first decade of the 19th century a set of new rationalized ministerial structures, 
Ministry of Internal Affairs, a Ministry of Finances, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a Ministry of mean, Ways of Communication, that's basically Transportation and Commerce, a State Comptroller's Office. The core of a set of rational, hierarchical, um, from the point of view of anybody who's in modern management, silos that are intended to manage functional aspects of the Russian imperial polity and economy. An effort to actually, in fact, create, via administrative rationality and regulation, well-being and commonweal. Alexander begins largely through the offices of an advisor that is plucked principally out of obscurity, the son of a priest, a man by the name of Mikhail Spiransky. Through the offices of Spiransky, Alexander embarks upon um, a consideration and the initial stages of a process that will lead to the creation of a new code of laws in the empire. Code of laws that actually won't be published until um, the late 1820s and early 1830s. But nevertheless, a code of law that, that attempts to bring some sort of order and rationality to the jumble, the maze-like character of Russian law and administration that had existed before that time. He even dabbles with the idea of reforming serfdom. Dabbles. Creating a set of legal structures that would allow serf owners voluntarily, if they so chose, to manumit, that is to free their serfs without land, without property, and with proper paperwork that would assure that they wouldn't just go floating off into space, but rather that they would be registered in another place, that order would be maintained. A set of laws that affect upwards, perhaps, of 100,000 um, uh, individuals over the course of his reign. Mild, to be sure, um, but nevertheless, right? reformist in character. And, and, and in some ways, fulfilling the hopes raised by this young man coming to the throne, succeeding his father, avoiding whatever fears had afflicted his older grandmother, and moving forward in a moderate way with the spirit of the age, political change, political reformation. It's our word, not his. Um, modernization and modernity itself. One barrier, however, Alexander refused to cross. He refused to countenance the notion that somehow or another his own autocratic prerogatives which by God-given legitimacy were entirely unconstrained. All power and authority was concentrated in his hands by tradition, by family obligation, and by God. And the notion that that power should be constrained, that there should be even a small official institutionalized council of aristocratic servitors from the best families of the realm to advise the emperor, to advise the executive on matters of state, both domestic and foreign, was too much to contemplate. Spiransky, the favored son of the priest advisor, who served Alexander so well in the first nine years of the 19th century, in 1809, formally made a proposal to the emperor that he consider some sort of institutionalized advisory council that, by definition, would constrain his ability to do whatever he wanted. Although I don't think Alexander ever thought of it in those terms. I can do whatever I want. But it's my obligation to make these final executive decisions. Offering that proposal to his mentor and to his emperor won him an appointment in Western Siberia as governor of Tobolsk. <laughs> now, you can see from this like wandering tale of the extended family, which is a very brief short course in political history. There goes my uh, uh, thing again. <laughs>
varied reactions to the French Revolution and to the era itself. From grandmother through, fa through father to son and then finally this last son who we'll conclude with today who will only come to the throne in 1825 but for whom one biographer basically argues um, for whom the French Revolution reinforced what were what was already a kind of genetic code imbued in him by membership in the Romanov royal house. The French Revolution left this man Nikolai Pavlovich, um, Nicholas I, the French Revolution left him suspicious of public opinion, itself a very new and radical concept that there was such a thing. It was just dawning after all. Distrustful of public opinion, a staunch and unquestioning defender of monarchical order. It's one thing to have a democratic polity out on the edges of the earth in North America. It's another thing to have a self-proclaimed republic where sovereignty rests in the people and the state is the expression of the popular will and the nation. It's altogether another thing to have that entity in the middle of civilization, the most civilized country of all at the time, France. The French Revolution reinforced for Nicholas a sense of the necessity of, descending, of defending the monarchical order that was part of the natural order of things. And above all else, it reinforced in him what ran throughout his family, an unquestioning sense of duty and his personal responsibility to uphold it. Now how that plays out, I want to um, look at um, a little bit further on today. So there's, you know, a consideration of, at least at the beginning of this period, a consideration of the French Revolutionary era itself and the kind of impact that it actually had upon Russian rulers and on the way in which they thought, those rulers, the way in which they thought about autocracy. So, um, oops, cell phone. I have to uh, make the uh, official announcement. Please turn off your cell phones uh, before we take off um, and all of the rest, right? I know that I don't have to, as I said last time, I don't have to go after uh, you all in terms of laptops in the back. I assume no one back there is actually looking at Facebook or uh, com <laughs> communicating with somebody in one corner of the room over to the other corner of the room. Um, text messages, of course, are completely allowed, so those of you who are uh, parents of teenagers as I am still, or more likely grandparents of teenagers, you know, you'll, you're discovering uh, the world of texting and how, above all else, you're not supposed to sign your textbook message, you know, grandma or grandpa, that's considered to be <laughs> totally uncool. They know your number, um, and they know where it's coming from. So, uh, <laughs> all right, well, we turn from um, one part of, of the era uh, to another. And so we really have to continue to, to, to think in a broader European scale. And really we have to think in terms of the, the, the global history that's on display here. Um, uh, and hence we have to think about uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, and um, what eventually becomes out of the rights of man and citizen, and a French Revolution of 1789 that by 1793 results in regicide, the execution of the monarchs in a ritualistic and symbolic way that thus devolves into terror and revolutionary war by 1804 becomes imperial, becomes an empire, um, the empire of the French. And I want to look at that, this and, um, and basically, right, um, for a bit at least, uh, a history of war and of um, international diplomacy. I mean, it is uh, necessary to say, not fair to say, it's necessary to say that in particular the first two decades, really the last decade of the 18th century and the first 15 years of the 19th century, roughly speaking a period of 25 years, a quarter of a century, was consumed by um, general European war. 
And general European war, that period of time, that also then, you know, if you're looking around for a label, okay, so I'm a graduate student and I'm supposed to be thinking about what am I supposed to be, how am I supposed to be organizing all this information? Or worse yet, I'm an undergrad wildly studying the night before the exam and knowing that there's going to be, you know, upwards of 50 IDs which are on there. I mean, how do I deal with, ah, Napoleonic Europe. What's Napoleonic Europe? So, you know, in a way, let's just slap the label on it that a graduate student would use to organize the mass of reading or that an undergraduate desperately trying to get a B or an A or a C or avoid a D um, would actually, you know, use to, okay, I got to organize this Napoleonic Europe and I got to be able somehow or another to define um, what that, that is. So, you know, let's just think about for a second the, the parameters, the outlines of of this period. The maps will help as I, as I go along. I mean, basically, you know, the outbreak of the French Revolution by, um, by, the execute, by the time that the monarchs are executed in early 1793 has led to a period that oftentimes in the books is essentially called the period of revolutionary wars. So that the new French Republic basically mobilizes military resources to defend itself against attacks from, in the first instance, Austria and Prussia and then by an increasingly larger coalition, all of them, of course, royal countries, monarchically ruled countries, an increasingly larger coalition that will include the United Kingdom on the one hand and the Russian Empire on the other. In 1793-1794, Republican armies defend the borders of the now revolutionary republic. Oftentimes, in fact, you know, on their bayonets, carrying banners that say liberty, equality, and fraternity. By the middle part of the 1790s, that defensive warfare has become offensive in character. And th those same armies, which have basically discovered what makes for a modern army, conscript the nation. Don't have a professional army, conscript the nation. The people themselves will defend the revolution. So that by 1795, these organized popular mass armies with their bayonets fluttering with liberty, equality, and fraternity are marching beyond the borders of France into the Low Countries, into Switzerland, into northern Italy and the northern Italian states. It's here that Napoleon basically um, emerges as a young, innovative, powerful and influential general, a Corsican, of course, by birth, but someone who by um, the end of that decade, and who, as the previous slide said, by 1804, had managed through his own skill, the circumstances of the era, um, his continuing string of military victories, had managed to raise himself to such a position of prominence that he became first, in essence, ruler for life and then emperor. Raising in the 19th century, and this will play all the way down into the Soviet period, for example, right, the question in the minds of any number of would-be revolutionaries subsequently, who plays the role of Bonaparte? Who ends the revolution? But also what we see, of course, right, in Napoleon's victories after 1804 and by 1807 is the wholesale defeat, on land at least, of all of his major opponents. The defeat and almost the dismemberment of Prussia. The defeat and the almost formal subjugation of the Austrian Empire. The defeat, although not the conquest, of the Russian Empire and an agreement in 1807 between Alexander and Napoleon that basically Russia would join Napoleon's continental blockade of the one power that continued to stand against him. That, of course, was England. And England's advantage was that ultimately it didn't have to worry about Napoleonic power on the continent of Europe, on the land, as long as it basically had the Royal Navy. A Royal Navy that had asserted British power on the seas at Trafalgar in 1805. And if Napoleon couldn't defeat England, he would attempt to starve it by instituting a continental system that required 
all of these countries on this bottom map in one fashion or another not to turn their commercial relations to the United Kingdom, or if they existed, to end them. What can be said, so what is Napoleonic Europe? I mean, it's the end result of Napoleon's military victories and a French military machine that combined conquest with indemnity and taxation of country, conquered countries, providing further funds and human resources to feed the military machine. A Napoleonic Europe where French power and influence also reached its apogee and reached its apex. Not only in terms of military power and perhaps not only in terms of, and it becomes more and more difficult to imagine this as the early 1800s go on, um, not only in terms of the inspiration of those words, liberty, equality, and fraternity, how much by 1805 did Napoleon believe in them, but how much would they inspire, because they continued to inspire, how much would they continue to inspire subjugated people who dreamed about the possibility of being freed from imperial subjugation? Not only by the French, but by the Austrians, or the Russians, and so forth. And ultimately as well, um, a, a French power and influence that was um, extended through French law. So the Napoleonic Code, which if anybody in the room has had to pass the bar in Louisiana, you'll know, of course, I gather, I've never had to do it, <laughs> that the requirements of the test undoubtedly are different than they are in most other states because in Louisiana, um, the foundation of the legal system is the Napoleonic Code. And a Napoleonic Code that spread across Europe and then in particular behind the armies of France that in particular took on the question that was most irregular in civilized Europe at the beginning of the 19th century, the continuing existence of serfdom. Where people were denied because of their birth, were denied certain basic rights, and thus denied the opportunity to fulfill their economic self-interest and generate as much in income and wealth as they possibly could. This doesn't extend to Russia, but it certainly extends into the Germanies where abolition of serfdom in, at the time and then in the aftermath of the Napoleonic conquests, that is the bringing to Central Europe of Napoleonic law, um, is a basic part of the story of how it is that serfdom in these places is abolished. So Napoleonic Europe by 1810, military conquest, French law, French ideas, at times even how subversive and radical they might have been and how unintended by 1810 the consequences of military conquerors, how, un, how, how disconnected those notions of liberty, equality, and fraternity might have been to the intentions of military conquerors by 1810. And then finally in Napoleonic Europe, which is simply captured in this map. At no time, arguably since the Holy Roman Empire or the Romans before them, had Europe been so united. Two 20th century analogs, it was when Hitler went to Paris after the conquest, he infamously stayed for barely a day, checked out the Eiffel Tower, and went to Napoleon's tomb, where he was caught in those, that famous picture staring with rapt attention at that huge monstrous tomb um, to be found in the center of Paris. He attempted to recreate this. There, of course, is a more inspiring and a democratically inspiring bookend to that particular story, which would essentially be at no other time until the formation of the European Union and the notion of a united Europe that actually upholds democratic values including the values of liberty, equality, and fraternity, over which these people continue to fight just like we do. Um, uh, at no other time since Napoleon was Europe as united as, um, as it is um, today. Okay, so having said that, then we have to key Tchaikovsky. <laughs> 
1812 Overture. So if I had had it together and could figure out how to get MP3s onto my computer, it would be playing right now, right? And I'm not going to da 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 boom da 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 I'm not going to actually go on and fracture your eardrums at any greater length than that. But, you know, we basically turn to what arguably is the climax of this story um, of the Napoleonic era and the Napoleonic Wars, the Great Confrontation the great confrontation that actually takes place between Napoleonic France and the Russian Empire in 1812. I mean, the Russian Empire looms in the East as far as Napoleon is concerned. It is in the minds of Europeans by 1812, it is a colossus. It's huge. You'll remember the population statistics from last time. It's populous. It has a seemingly unending supply of people. They might be peasant, and they might be illiterate, and they might be dumb, but it's an unending supply. And they're always parading around. And they're always involved in the coalitions, which have been defeated, the coalitions against Napoleon. They participate in the continental blockade, the empire does, although sporadically and with plenty of good Russian corruption and cheating thrown into it because essentially the continental blockade greatly disrupts imperial commerce with the United Kingdom, which had especially flo flowed from Russian forests, wood, timber, tar, pitch, all of it necessary for ship construction. In some ways the confrontation is inevitable and the confrontation comes in the summer of 1812, when Napoleon masses an army on um, the borders of Poland and um, the western parts of the Russian Empire, a grand army of over 600,000 men, only 270,000 of which were Frenchmen, the rest of whom were either conscripted from conquered nations or joined willingly in the invasion of Russia. This was especially true, true of Poles, who faced with the choice between um, Napoleonic law and French ideas of freedom and liberty and Russian imperial subjugation, which was still fresh in Polish memory from the partitions that had been conducted in the second half of the 18th century in the empire that removed Poland from the map, Poles willingly joined the Grand Army and march into, um, uh, into the empire in uh, June 21, 22 of 1812. The dates become important only because it's exactly the same day, exactly the same night that um, Nazi Germany will invade the Soviet Union in June of 1941. Now, this story, and it's not one that I, wanna, that I want to or am qualified um, to tell at, um, at great length. If anybody's really interested in military history, there's a handout that I sent around. Somebody had asked about it last week, and my apologies for not having it there last week. Um, one book that's not on there is the, actually the first study of the Russian side of this war by a historian whose name is uh, Dominic Levin. Uh, 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 Dom's name is on the list. He also is an author of a biography of Nicholas II. But it's a study that just was released of the Napoleonic campaign in, in Russia. So, I mean, if you're really interested in this kind of stuff, it's a great book um, and actually also looks at the period more generally as well. The pictures that are here more or less capture the, um, the major parts of this campaign that, in fact, continued to be memorialized down through um, the 19th century. The 1812 Overture was performed for the first time in 1881 in St. Petersburg. This was an anniversary. This victory ultimately was an anniversary that was commemorated again and again and again by the old regime. An, an offensive onslaught by an army that no one had been able to defeat, a strategy of retreat into the interior, although a strategy that also included harassment and attack of the wings of the main column to the south and to the north of the main line of attack that headed toward Moscow. 
eventually a decision to stand and fight, to find ground in what is basically flat, arable, semi-forested land to the east of the capital city of Moscow at Borodino. A battle that resulted in the withdrawal of Russian forces beyond Moscow, but in a bloodying and battering of French troops already at a relatively late stage of the season in the Russian interior. The French occupation of Moscow, it's famous, because it is, the famous conflagration of the city um, over the, this period of time, the 15th through the 19th of September, probably set, most likely set, by Russians themselves to deny um, the winter haven and to not, to, that, that Napoleonic armies required, um, and basically to deny um, them of any sort of supply that would be necessary to supply the army and withstand the winter. The decision delayed to retreat from Moscow, um, begun relatively late in the season, a season that, in fact, at this point, then, you know, historically in the argument, in comes General Winter. Um, uh, an early winter season that actually turns cold very quickly. And so that a retreat begun in October and November. By November, when the French exit the empire and cross the Berezina, um, a, a river marking the western borderland of the empire, the Grand Army has mainly been destroyed. Two-thirds of it, the victims in one fashion or another of death, about 270,000 have been killed, about 200,000 have been captured, the rest diseased, disorganized, defeated, and driven out of the empire. Okay, so what then follows, to get Napoleon out of our hair, um, what then follows is the so-called Wars of Liberation. The gr a gradual movement over the course of the next two years of coalition forces, largely Russian, Prussian, and Austrian, back across Eastern and Central Europe, defeating um, the remnants and the remobilized uh, units of the French army at key battles along the way, and ultimately Napoleon's surrender in uh, the spring early, late winter of 1814. And the Allies, triumphantly, with Alexander I, Tsar of all the Russias in the lead, triumphantly entering Paris at that time. Napoleon is arrested, exiled to the Isle of Elba. He returns for the 100 days. He escapes his imprisonment and exile in the Mediterranean, returns to France for a brief period of time, March to June of 1815, remobilizes his army, and then in June of 1815 gives us that famous phrase, he meets his Waterloo. I want to think for a second with you about the consequences of this military history. I like to tell students at, the, at, at this stage that I'm not a military historian, even though as a as the, as the son, as a boomer, who grew up in a household whose parents actually actively remembered my mother and served in my father the Second World War, I reenacted it throughout my childhood. So we all had a hat and we all had a helmet and we all played war and we all stormed the beaches and we all bombed Tokyo and you know, we, were always, we always played soldiers. And I think the Civil War got me into history, although it wasn't this version of the Civil War, it was that version of the Civil War in the land of Lincoln, but still, right? But by the time I became a professional historian, I'm not particularly interested in military history per se. And actually, it's, while it's wildly popular among generalist audiences, it's not particularly all that popular among professional historians. Hence, you know, there's only now is there actually a really good book by a really great historian, Dominic Levin, um, on the Russian part of the Napoleonic campaign. I mean, otherwise, this all gets pieced together, right? And has been pieced together over long periods of time. Tidbit here, tidbit there, story here, story there, and thus, you know, my version of it. And now, basically, I have to rewrite the lecture because, you know, I basically have to get leaving into the thing, right? 
Um, but war, uh, needless to say, as we all have seen in our own lifetimes, war has absolutely fundamental consequences and, and affects the, the way in which individuals through societies to cultures react and behave and are shaped. There's, nobody in this room needs any convincing of that truism. So what are the consequences, at least some of them, of this Napoleonic era for, for Russia? Well, the first of them, and perhaps the smallest jump required, is to actually link war and diplomacy and war and international affairs. So what the first consequence most strikingly of this is a new European international order that's established by the victors at the Congress of Vienna. One of the great architects of this new international order is the Austrian Chancellor Metternich and one of the great diplomats of our long recently past century, the 20th, wrote his PhD dissertation on the diplomacy of that great international diplomat. Henry Kissinger earned his spears and learned his spurs and learned his art <laughs> and maybe actually his spears, come to think of it, right? <laughs> By studying Metternich and studying the Congress of Vienna. A Congress that in particular um, was dedicated to two basic notions. There could be no re-emergence of French Republican power and monarchical orders, politically, socially, and culturally, had to be maintained on the continent. Because, and here I'm paraphrasing, and I'm sure it would be hard to find this in, in the documents, but I think the sentiment is there because, as I said before, monarchical order is the natural existing state of things. Now, both of those precepts, the containment of French republican and revolutionary power and the maintenance of monarchical order were far more easily said than done. A revolution takes place in Europe, in France, in 1830, in 1848, <laughs> in 1872, um, and plainly by the time you get to 1872, mon monarchy is not the only way to go um, on, on the European continent. But the first consequence of the Napoleonic era is to, for the victors, to look to the past. And how do we reconstitute what was? And how do we ensure that it basically stays that way? Not to embrace change, despite all of the change that had taken place, but to embrace and proclaim the necessity of maintaining stasis. One of the major brokers of this deal is the Russian Empire. And in fact, right, the biggest broker of all is the conqueror of Napoleon. Alexander I, if you've been to the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, you can walk into a hallway and see this portrait. And it's surrounded, it's an entire corridor of paintings of generals who served in these campaigns. They're all honored in a special hall of honor. And at the center of this hall is this regal, imperial, powerful Alexander, whose victory pro proclamation to the army is contained on this slide. And it measures and it assesses the accomplishment. Indeed, it measures and assesses the national pride. In an era when nationalism still also is a word that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the stirrings of national accomplishment of what the Russian people, and particularly Russian officers, young men, and the women they left behind, older parents who had put up with the trepidations and the depredations of wartime, what they had in fact endured. The year has ended, a year forever memorable and glorious, one in which you have trampled in the dust the insolent aggressor. The year has passed, but your heroic deeds survive. Time will not efface their trace. They are present to your contemporaries. They will live with your posterity. You have acquired rights to the gratitude of Russia, 
and to the admiration of mankind. A colossus in the East, an imperial power in the East, which had done what no one else had been able to do, defeat Napoleonic tyranny. Right? Imperial power, imperial prestige, imperial grandeur was never as high as it was in 1814. But there's another side to this, and this begins to basically move us, excuse me, um, begins to move us away from Napoleon um, and back to the social and cultural elites of the realm. Alexander, for the sake of the argument and in the interest of time, Alexander's reign typically is divided by historians into two halves, before and after the war. Before the war, he could even be imagined as a Jacobin sympathizer, certainly as a reformer. Look what he did with law, look what he did with the ministries. He even dabbled with serfdom. But after the war, he actually becomes increasingly conservative, increasingly static. He was, after all, an author of the new settlement at the Congress of Vienna, which said, no reemergence of Republican radicalism and the absolute necessity of maintaining monarchical order. So there's a question about the way in which a young man of 18 or 19 read Tolstoy's War and Peace and look at the officers in that novel. Tolstoy almost was one. You know, he's, only, he's only a decade or two behind this generation. Who, in fact, if they made it from Moscow to Paris, had as, you know, I'll tell the undergraduates, um, had an all expenses paid study abroad trip <laughs> through Europe, <laughs> through all its great capitals, to the center of civilization itself, the city of light. And the city of light wasn't, in fact, the Paris of today, of course, that's only constructed later in the century. The city of light was the city of light because it was the city of the enlightenment. It was the, it was the site of all these ideas. So look at what memoirists say, and I'll stop. Yep. Frank, how come Alexander has a bridge named after him in Paris? Uh, because for large portions of the, uh, of the 19th century, uh, the French state is not um, particularly friendly toward um, uh, political radicalism. Um, and that's, I don't know actually when that, actually, you know what, I don't think it's Alexander the First, it's the Alexander the Third Bridge, if I'm not <coughs> mistaken, although I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure either. I mean, I, it, it, I think it's Alexander the uh, Third, and I was actually just going to start speeding off on, an, on a different um, and obviously wrong answer. Um, <laughs> uh, Alexander the Third actually cements a diplomatic alliance with, uh, with the French Republic in, uh, at the beginning of the 1890s, which is actually the document that binds Russia and France together in the First World War, and I think it's the Alexander III Bridge, although I'm uh, willing to be corrected. So, you know, I'm going to leave that. That's your homework. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, draw on two memoirs um, of, uh, of, of, of the era. Right? So here's one of these anonymous officers who's basically commenting on what was it like to come home? and live in Petersburg by 1818 or so. You know, life in Petersburg was tiresome. When I was abroad, 1812, 1814, think what went through my mind and what I saw. And think about what I was not only a witness to, but a participant in. And now look at what I confront. Boy, do my students, our students, oftentimes think of us, I think, in exactly this sort of way, especially on a morning just before four days of freedom. <laughs> now it was unbearable to look at the empty life in Petersburg and listen to the babbling of the old men who praised the past and reproached every progressive move. We were distanced from them by a hundred years. Or another one. During the campaigns through Germany and France, our young men became acquainted with European civilization, which produced upon them the strongest impression 
They were able to compare all that they had seen abroad with what confronted them at every step at home. Slavery of the majority of Russians, cruel treatment of subordinates by superiors, all sorts of government abuses, and general tyranny. All this stirred intelligent Russians and provoked patriotic sentiment. Now, you know, that's post-Napoleonic malaise, which would be really interesting as a, as a study of a post-war generation. Um, certainly, uh, the lost generation spawned an entire literature in the 1920s around similar sorts of themes. But it also becomes important in the context of the Russian historical narrative because these individuals actually become involved in an attempt to act that is basically sparked by circumstance. Alexander I dies unexpectedly in early December of 1825. His brother Konstantin, who is the governor general of, of, of Warsaw and rules basically Russian Poland for reasons that have to do with him biographically, passes on the throne. The next oldest brother, Nicholas, he of the distrust of public opinion, the firm defense of monarchical order, and an uncompromising sensibility of duty, assumes the throne instead. Although there's confusion about a, su a succession that Alexander didn't, in fact, publicize, that people are confused about, and that actually create a set of circumstances where these, some of these young men, whose memoirs I quoted to you, had basically been involved in discussion circles over the course of the previous 10 years or so. Discussion circles that bred talk of political change, political reform, constitutional limitations on the monarch, perhaps even the necessity of republican forms of government. They were all former or serving officers in major imperial guards regiments and at the time uh, and, and basically began to concoct in 1824 and 1820, in 1824 conspiratorial plans to um, pressure or overthrow the monarch. It was talk. But talk blended into circumstances, an opportunity arose when on 14 December 1825, Nicholas is officially proclaimed emperor and as part of the ritual of the passage of power, Imperial Guards regiments are required to swear allegiance to the new ruler. Um, they're marched, those of you who have been to St. Petersburg may recognize this scene. You know, the bronze horseman, Peter the Great, who sits on the river Neva, um, uh, pointing uh, his hand toward Finland nowadays, um, uh, who Pushkin famously wrote about, the bronze horseman, you know, coming to life and galloping and chasing um, an author through the streets of a flooded St. Petersburg. Absolutely necessary to read um, Pushkin at some point. Um, uh, members of the Guards regiments are marched to Senate Square. That's what this square is called told to swear allegiance to, at least as the anecdote has it, to Konstantin i Konstitutsia. Konstantin Pavlovich, the older brother, who's already passed, i Konstitutsia, Constitution. It's argued, whether this is apocryphal or not, is impossible to say. It's argued that some soldiers um, in these guards' regiments, illiterate to semi-illiterate peasants, think that they're swearing allegiance actually to Konstantin and his wife, Constitutia. It's a feminine noun, right? And so it rings feminine in, um, in, in, to, the, to the ear, right? It's a tragic comedy, of course, although what ends up happening is that by the end of the day, loyal troops are summoned, artillery is summoned, and the uprising is put down with some death. The ringleaders are arrested, upwards of 500 members of some of the empire's greatest families. It's like all the great families were touched by this conspiracy in one fashion or another, either to join or not to join. Either to say I participated in it or to say I knew nothing about it. Six of them are, is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, two, 
four, six. Six of them are executed, which actually requires a special waiver of the law because a, a right of noble privilege, and all these people are noblemen, a right of noble privilege instituted by Catherine the Great is no capital punishment, except for reasons of state. Many more of them are exiled to Siberia and famously followed by their wives. And here, actually, if we're thinking about consequences of the Napoleonic era and this episode and what it symbolized for Russia, this slide actually suggests two things. On the one hand, because this is a Soviet wall plaque from Leningrad days. On the one hand, this Decemberist uprising, if you were to read the hagiography of the 20th century, opened up the possibility of a radical future. However ham-handed, however uh, tragicomical the actual events themselves were, the Decemberist uprising opened up the possibility of wholesale radical change. And it also, in a second set of symbols, right? Second set of, uh, think about a structure of ideas and values. It presented a model and a symbol of people of privilege sacrificing for the future of the people. Sacrificing for the nation. Sacrificing for Russia's future. And it's one thing for a man to sacrifice, but especially in the Victorian era, which we're now moving into, when women historians tell us again and again and again are placed on a pedestal. They're a marker of home life, of welfare, of family well-being. What symbolizes sacrifice for the future by people of privilege more than these women basically marching off and abandoning their lives of privilege, marching off to follow their husbands into a Siberian exile that would last until the death of the Emperor Nicholas I in 1855. And those are consequences. A third consequence of these events, and really thus of um, the Napoleonic era itself, is the coming to the throne of Nicholas I, known as the gendarme of Europe. Gendarme for good reason, actually. Nicholas acts to um, uphold his duty. And his duty is to maintain monarchical order at home and in Europe. Monarchical order in Europe in the period of his reign trembles. In France, it's overthrown in 1830 and again in 1848. He opposes but can do nothing about it given the distance. In Poland, monarchical order is questioned by one of a series of Polish uprisings in the 19th century. And here, um, this uprising is put down with Russian imperial military force. In 1848, the springtime of the peoples, something akin to eight, 1989 in European history. When across Europe, starting in Paris and in France, and extending all the way to Prague and to Budapest, and even via rumors into the empire itself. National uprisings, national movements for national freedom break out across Europe and in all the European capitals and Nicholas commits military force into Hungary in late 1848, a first Hungarian revolution, 19, uh, invasion. 1956 isn't the first one. The first one actually takes place in 1848, a commitment of Russian imperial forces into Hungary to put down um, basically a nationalist uprising against the, uh, against the Habsburg crown. He is the gendarme of Europe, and if you've, again, if you've been to St. Petersburg, this looming statue of him in front of St. Isaac's Cathedral, if you stand beneath it and look up at it, says something about autocratic power on this pedestal of metal on a huge charger with a huge helmet and an imperial double eagle um, across it. His commitment was to maintain monarchical order, but he was a complex character. Because this was, after all, in the last five minutes I've got left to me, this was, after all, a period of stasis and change. You can defend monarchical order all you want, but a railroad begins to change the way people think about everything. 
a railroad changes the way people think about time and space. A textile plant, first in England run by water wheels, and by the time of Nicholas's reign run by steam engines, changes the way that people dress and the way in which they consume. This is an era of stasis and change. And the two are fundamentally intertwined. It'd be difficult to pull them apart. So to maintain monarchical order requires not just sitting there saying, I'm the czar. It requires reform. So Nicholas, upholding his duty, sponsors an expansion of education. There are only six universities in the empire at this time, but he adds the sixth in Kiev. He creates in the 1830s a state gymnasium system, right, a system of secondary education, of state secondary education, to feed what for him is absolutely critical, a growing technical elite, and establishes a, as well, most famously in St. Petersburg, it's, to, it's a metro stop, Technologiczki Institut, um, St. Petersburg Technological Institute in the 1820s. Architecture, an architectural change. So he sponsors and funds the building of a church even bigger than St. Peter's in Rome, St. Isaac's Cathedral um, in downtown St. Petersburg. Oops, I guess I have to go someplace. Hang on. <laughs> Science develops, um, particularly mathematics in this time. This guy is educated for the first 20 years of his life in Nicholas's reign and will go on to great fame because, you know, he's the guy who, and at this point they always jump in and say, yeah, yeah, the periodic table of elements, you know, I know this part. Um, uh, Mendeleev, more important later on, but educated in Nicholas's time. For the historian, I have to put it up, official s historical scholarship begins at this time, professional, scientific study of the past. The first railroads. A small and minor one, a toy one in 1829, built between two palaces, downtown St. Petersburg and Zadarske Silo, the Catherine Palace, the blue one for those of you who have been um, to the city and its environs. But then in the 1850s, the first major rail system that will rapidly expand in the, in the late 50s and then into the 60s and 70s, um, a main trunk line running between the two capital cities of, um, of St. Petersburg and Moscow. They're plainly still today. It's an era of great literature. Even though many of these people will fall afoul of Nicholas's censorship, especially in the last years of his reign after the springtime of the peoples in 1848. Dostoevsky most notably. Dostoevsky doesn't make any sense when you read Brothers K in particular unless you take into account the fact that he participated in a student circle um, in the late 1840s and found himself caught up in a dragnet by the secret police and was exiled to Siberia where he basically plumbed the depths of human psychology. Music and the great opera tradition of, of, of Russia, Mikhail Glinka in particular. We've talked already about law and administrative regularity, an expansion of bureaucracy in an effort, though, to professionalize it and to link bureaucratic office and bureaucratic promotion with education. Although satirists made a field day of the kinds of bureaucrats that ultimately came out of education like this. Two final um, comments on the period, on stasis and change, on the apogee of autocracy. One comes from the Minister of Education, Sergei Uvarov, who coined a aphorism of sorts about the three pillars upon which the Russian Empire rested. Religious orthodoxy, Russian autocracy, and narodnost, a sense of, it's translated, of official nationality a romantic, backward-looking, agrarian-inspired vision of a 
commu of a community resting in a peasant village where peasants loyally obey their lords and the present is maintained on the foundation of the past and as the door is opening, right? A second critique. And this from a man whose name was Peter Chadayev. And Chadayev basically, as you can read here in this slide, asked a different question about Russian reality and compared it, I love this quote, right? Compared his contemporary moment to being a child in a crib. A child with very little sense of the past, therefore very little sense of the future, no sense of values, no sense of independent autonomy, no ability ultimately to mount a critique of the existing order of things, much like a child with a nurse peering into the crib, think Nicholas the first, <laughs> waving the rattle in front of um, one's eyes. One commentator was heard to note with this I end, when Nicholas expired in 1855 after 30 years of reign, um, Russia, Anna Strana, Fasadi i Paradi. Russia, she's a country of the facade and the parade. Right? So what we have to look at next time is an era called the Great Reforms, because change, of course, can't be contained. Um, it can only be diverted for a while. And now we have, we'll turn to that next time. So I'm way over, um, and I got to get out of here. So thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>